This is Tibet, an autonomous region in China situated literally at the rooftop of the world, and also Brad Pitt was there. If you look at the history of Chinese dynasties, you will notice that Tibet was considered as a part of China only relatively briefly in the grand scheme of things. Tibetan people and Han Chinese people may look similar and share the same language family, but they are two distinct people group with different writing systems, history, lifestyles, and cultures. So how did Tibet become a part of China? Well, if you are a hardcore supporter of the Chinese government, you may say that Tibet will always be a part of the China, and we should not discuss anything that may undermine the Chinese national unity and sovereignty. But if you are a typical student who is just trying to pass your history exams and could not give two craps about Chinese politics, then the story of Tibet and China kinda began with the definition of Chinese civilization. The Chinese civilization has its origins in the Yellow River region. The ancient Chinese people have a Sinocentric view, basically saying that the further you are from the Chinese civilization, the more barbaric you are. So by the ancient Chinese definition, Tibetan people are barbarians. Meanwhile, the Tibetan people are happily minding their own business at the top of the world. Later, a dude from India or Nepal got enlightened, and Buddhism spread across Asia. Tibetan and Chinese people became one of the biggest fans of Buddhism. Tibet rose into prominence with the Tibetan Empire, which was the contemporary of the Chinese Tang Dynasty. At its peak, the Tibetan Empire extended its power into large areas of Central Asia, controlled modern-day Yunnan, reaching south towards the Ganges River Delta, and even occupied the capital city of Tang Dynasty for a couple of weeks. The Tibetan Empire and the Chinese Tang Dynasty fought for control over Central Asia. Then, the Tang Dynasty collapsed, and the Tibetan Empire declined soon after. Tibet became fragmented, but got really obsessed with Buddhism things. The Mongols came along, defeating everyone. The Mongol Yuan Dynasty controlled China proper and Tibet. Tibet was managed by the Bureau of Buddhist and Tibetan Affairs, separated from other provinces such as those governed by the former Chinese Song Dynasty. Tibet managed to stay autonomous and retain its non-Chinese identity even when being united with China proper under the Mongolian banner. With the decline of Yuan Dynasty, Tibet became de facto independent. The neighboring Chinese Ming Dynasty made little effort to control Tibet, good relations good stuff. Lots of people and politics came and went. Then, this Mongolian dude came along and united Tibet under the Koshut Khanate, and the fifth Dalai Lama acted as the spiritual and civil authority in Tibet. The Koshut Khanate would eventually be conquered by the Dzungar Khanate, another bunch of Mongolians who controlled bits of Tibet. Meanwhile, the non-Chinese Manchurians managed to become stronger, beating up the Chinese Ming Dynasty, and established the Qing Dynasty in China proper. Qing Dynasty went on to beat up everyone along its way, expanding into Central Asia, beating up the Dzungars who were controlling Tibet. Tibet thus came under Qing control. In other words, modern-day Tibet and China proper got shipped together by their former Mongol and Manchu overlords centuries ago. During Qing's rule of Tibet, Tibet maintained its autonomy and distinct cultural identity. The Qing dynasty had to push out invaders who wanted bits of Tibet, which include the Nepalese and the Sikh empire from the Indian subcontinent. When the Indian subcontinent came under the control of the British Empire, Tibet became the hottest real estate contested between the Qing dynasty and Britain. The Qing dynasty gradually weakened in the 19th century. As part of the Great Game, Britain wanted to protect India from Russian expansion. Thus, Britain exerted influence into lands beyond the Indian borders, which include Tibet. Britain managed to invade and captured Lhasa at one point. The Dalai Lama fled to China proper. Of course, Britain made some treaties which were advantageous for itself. Qing Dynasty, feeling humiliated and not wanting to lose out to the ever-expanding British Empire, sent a military expedition into Tibet to establish direct rule. The Dalai Lama fled to India. After the Xinhai Revolution which toppled the Qing Dynasty, the Qing troops was escorted out of Tibet. The Dalai Lama declared himself ruler of an independent Tibet. 
Tibet remained de facto independent for a few decades, and signed a bunch of treaties with other independent countries such as Mongolia and Britain. Tibet also had beef with some Chinese warlords over parts of China. After China finished beating itself, the communist government of China annexed slash liberated Tibet in 1950. Tibet rebelled in 1959, but failed. The Dalai Lama fled to India, China was angry with India. China and India also had some border disputes, partly thanks to Britain, and the victim is Tibet. Since then, Tibet had some unrests from time to time to protest against the Chinese government, whilst their Dalai Lama never returned to Tibet, and here we are today. The inclusion of Tibet into the definition of China is a testament to the inclusion slash domination of Han Chinese over the traditional non-Han Chinese lands, making China a multi-ethnic country as we know it today. In an effort to promote national unity and to spur economic developments, the Chinese government invested in massive infrastructure projects to link Tibet with the rest of China. Some Tibetans reckon that these government investments are a part of the Chinese government's plan to promote Sinicization of Tibet. From the Chinese government point of view, Sinicization is a normal event in the context of the long Chinese history, like how the ancient Chinese people Sinicized the crap out of southern China, turning Austronesian and Austroasiatic people into Han Chinese people. From Tibet's point of view, Sinicization can be a gradual cultural genocide, slowly wiping out the distinct Tibetan identity. Political motives aside, are the typical average Tibetans happy to be a part of China? Well, the average Tibetans do benefit from the economic and infrastructure investments, but there is an underlying Han Chinese dominance. Also, some Han Chinese people have a sense of snobbery and superiority, which can rub some Tibetans off. The Chinese treatment of the Tibetan protesters definitely did not make the Chinese government more popular in Tibet, giving the Tibetan nationalists reasons to push for independence. Nevertheless, no matter how loud Tibet or any other foreign countries are shouting for Tibetan independence, the Chinese government is unlikely to let Tibet to become independent, because this will be seen as a sign of national weakness, opening up opportunities for the foreign countries to tear China apart, reminding China of its trauma during the 19th century. If Tibet becomes independent again, Xinjiang might push for independence, and maybe Hong Kong can have a chance too if the dominoes continue to fall. An independent Tibet will become the bridge between India and China, a pawn squeezed between two global economic and military powers, good luck. With the rise of China as the global superpower, Tibet is likely to remain as a part of China for the foreseeable future. As China has a cycle of unity and fragmentation throughout its history, maybe someday Tibet will become independent again, who knows. Thanks for watching.